Emergencies can happen at a moment's notice. And while we may want to shelter in place, recent events have shown that that isn't always an option. Look at the recent fires in Los Angeles. A whole bunch of people had to evacuate for that. Or I don't know, maybe the floods in Western North Carolina last year. A lot of people had to evacuate for that too. Being able to pick up and go is essential. But when it comes to communications, setting up an alternative to cell phones would require equipment far too large to fit in a backpack. At least until now. You see your cell phone, you pay month to month for a network that somebody has already gone and installed somewhere else. When you start developing your own decentralized communication methods, it's you who has to set up the network. So how do you do that? Well, this is where it begins to get tricky. Today, we're going to tackle this complex situation, and we're going to tackle it by talking about one specific piece of equipment that I promised I would talk to you about back in a previous video. You see, in my last video, I told you that we were going to meet again to talk about the Hytera HR652, and that is what today's video is all about. We're going to deep dive not just that particular machine, but how repeaters work in general, the differences between DMR and analog and Hytera DMR versus other DMR alternatives, time slots, all sorts of other things that we're going to dive off into. We're going to take it piece by piece so that you can hang in there and really absorb everything that this video has to offer so that you're in a better position to begin establishing your own radio network so that you can get that cell phone like experience, but decentralized and not totally subject to someone else's terms of service or their towers being down or whatever the case may be. Now, if you landed on this page, it's probably because the algorithm or you have already determined that you're interested in finding another means of communicating outside of the standard cell phone. Many of us, I know myself, when I got into radios, it was because I had determined that I needed an alternate method of communication. I wanted that communication method to perform like the communication methods I was used to, such as my cell phone. I want to send pictures. I want to pick up and call and talk all the way around the world. That's the appeal. That's the thing that we're trying to get to. And that's reasonable. We've had numerous internet outages and cell phone outages over the last few years. Of course, the big AT&T outage in February of 24 comes to mind. If you haven't already come to this conclusion on your own and this is a new idea, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below for our next video where we overview pace plans at large, how to develop them, why you might need them, why they're important. And we will certainly go through and cover that topic in depth. But this video assumes that you've already understood the concept of a pace plan. You recognize the need for an alternate to traditional primary communications, and you're interested in learning more about that subject. So stick around as we dive into this video about the Hytera HR652. Once upon a time, the only way that you could have a functioning radio system is by having what you have behind me. Hundreds of feet of coax, large towers, antennas, and at the bottom, a big humongous radio room with filters, duplexers, and all sorts of other equipment at the bottom of them that make this whole thing tick. But along the way, somebody said, man, I sure would love to put all that in a backpack and take it with me and go put it up somewhere. And now we have products like the Hytera HR652. Let's go to the bench and talk more specifically about the anatomy and what the HR652 does. It's my belief that before you can fully appreciate the HR652, we need to do a little bit of Repeater 101 radio basics. I do feel like it's important here to note that a lot of people, when they have the discussion of should I get a DMR radio, it's really just centered around I need encryption. The benefit of DMR specifically is that it operates using this specific modulation type known as TDMA. TDMA stands for Time Division Multiple Access. To best understand Time Division Multiple Access, we could probably use the example of a highway. A highway has three lights, and at any given time, it can only be three cars wide. Radio frequencies are kind of similar. You're operating inside of this envelope. Maybe you have 10 radio operators using that envelope, or maybe you have 100 radio operators using that envelope. You have to figure out how to best manage that envelope in that space, which is increasingly difficult on analog modulation types most commonly found on Baofeng EV5Rs on FM modulation. DMR has a strategic and technological advantage here by offering two different time slots for one given frequency. This means that you essentially are creating a magic fourth lane in this three lane highway analogy that allows you to fit another person in that space. Typically, the time slots and which time slot your radio is working on is selected during the programming of the radio. This is where the magic of Hytera's very specific pseudo trucking technology comes into play. You see, pseudo trucking can automatically choose what the best time slot is to get the best path to the other radio. Now, this is not a feature that's found on 
every DMR tier two radio. This is a feature that is found on high terror radio. So we're not going to specifically stay in this high terror territory for too long. Uh, but I do have to give you that information because ultimately the video is about the HR652, which is a high terror product. Now, with regard to repeaters, you've got from pretty simple terminology here, simplex and duplex. On one frequency, you've got RF coming in. It records that and reprocesses it and it retransmits it back out on the same antenna that it was received on. Now stop right there for a second and think about the fact that using a single frequency repeater might prevent some good radio traffic from coming through because it's being overwhelmed by more than one radio at a time. A duplex repeater is far more efficient. So now, combine the uh, TDMA with the pseudo trunking with a duplex machine and you can understand how much more efficient a machine like this is. This is something that can be thrown into a backpack. It's got a nine hour battery life. It can be IP connected to other machines of the same type. You can begin to understand that you could have a very large radio operation going on, sharing tag data, sharing location, sharing encryption, having voice to voice communications. All of that can be happening on a set of given frequencies without any packet loss or uh, failed transmissions because you have such this, this wide breadth of access that everything's able to flow through. So I wanted to talk about analog simplex operation. The radio, whether it's UHF or VHF, or that's to say 400 megahertz or 100 megahertz, the radio is dependent upon line of sight. And we've talked about this. I'm not going to beat this dead horse in this video, but it's to say that the radios can communicate to one another when they have good line of sight. There are caveats to this where in some cases radio frequencies can be reflected off of buildings and other objects. Ultimately, that's still line of sight, but maybe not what we're thinking when we're talking about point A to point B with nothing in between. But for the sake of this video and for staying simple, simplex communications that are happening on analog radios are happening on the same frequency with good line of sight from radio A to radio B. Now, we've probably all seen bubble pack, and when I say bubble pack, I mean like radios that you buy at Walmart or whatever, that advertise 30 miles of range. Now, while this is hypothetically possible, uh, it would maybe only be possible in somewhere like the Bonneville Salt Flats or from one peak to another, uh, where you just ha have absolutely no obstructions and optimal propagation where your radio communication is going from point A to point B. Perhaps you've purchased one of these bubble pack radios and been like, man, I barely got a mile out of this thing. Well, that's uh, due in part to the fact that you didn't understand uh, how it worked. That's probably because you weren't subscribed and liked. So be sure and do that down below so that you can watch our other videos to learn more about radio fundamentals. Uh, but it was also due to the fact that there was salacious marketing involved that tricked you into thinking that this little bubble pack radio set that you got from Target or whatever was going to have that capability. Um, as you probably found out by now, that's not the case. Now, there are some things that block line of sight. Think about them in your head. I'll give you a second. All right, that second's over. Some things that may block line of sight are things such as terrain features. We've already mentioned mountains, but things such as trees, vehicles, tall buildings. It's because of that fact that we use repeaters and that repeaters have become ubiquitous within radio space. Now, there's an exception to this, which is HF radio. And I have a whole five-part series about HF radio and why it's an exception. But the short of it is that those radio frequencies are bouncing off of the atmosphere. Therefore, they're able to make it a much longer range because they still have line of sight uh, because they're refracted off the atmosphere down to the intended recipient. Um, now, why can't we do that with VHF and UHF radios? It is because of the fact that the radio waves are such that they penetrate the atmosphere. So in HF, you have lower frequency. That means that the waves are longer. They happen less frequently. Because it happens uh, at a longer interval, it makes them more susceptible to bouncing off of, I think it's the F layer of the atmosphere, and ending up at their recipient. When you have radios that are VHF or UHF, the frequency begins to be much quicker in a given time, and that ultimately doesn't bounce off. It just passes right through the atmosphere. So VHF and UHF radios are not going to do that. In this case, we're, we're limited to person-to-person -person line of sight. We don't have the atmosphere working for us. So we have to integrate and build systems that help us out in doing that. And in this case, the kind of the commonly accepted way to do that is by building repeater towers. Get it up to the repeater tower, the repeater tower will send it out somewhere else. All right, now the question you're probably asking yourself at this point is why does it matter? Why does it matter if I'm using VHF or UHF and why do we have to remember all of these different specific characteristics of each one? Well, 
It's important because each band has its own benefits and its own drawbacks. But perhaps the easiest way to explain this to you uh, is to talk about the Wi-Fi that's in your home. The Wi-Fi that's in your home is likely operating on either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, uh, whereas HF radio or high frequency is 7 megahertz. Now, the difference between those two is a lot of things, but you can probably best associate it with the fact that the Wi-Fi in your home has the capability to stream gigs and gigs and gigs of data. You might binge watch a Netflix show all night, and your Wi-Fi keeps up. However, if you step 300 feet or so away from your house, the range you'll notice falls off dramatically. This is where Wi-Fi repeaters come in or more focused Yagi antennas for Wi-Fi to try and extend the range past the inevitably short range uh, that occurs when you start dealing with very high frequencies like 5 gigahertz. Now, we do get better propagation. That's to say we get more range on VHF, 146 megahertz, uh, a far cry from 5 gigahertz, but we aren't able to stream as much data. It would be relatively impossible. I'm just going to go out and say right out impossible to stream a, a Netflix show for hours and hours on end on VHF frequencies. It just would not perform very well. So we need all of these different protocols and all of these different modulation types and all of these different bands. We need to understand these and utilize these so that we can pick and choose what tool to use for a given instance. We're going to continue to talk about range here in this next segment so that you can better understand why we even need repeaters and how we use them. Now, let's talk about the type of range that you can expect on analog radios uh, given good line of sight you know, traditions. In flat terrain, you're probably talking about four to five miles. Inside of a building, you're talking about maybe between eight and 14 floors. In urban environments, maybe one to two miles. And in more rural environments, maybe two to four miles. So with analog covered, let's move on to talking about DMR radios. When using DMR radios, multiple groups of people can talk into something known as talk groups. You can think about these talk groups like their own sub-file. The main file is the frequency that you're on. The talk group you're selecting is all of the different files in that main file that you're on. So, you may have a DMR tower in your local area that is, let's say, set up on 446.780. That is the frequency. But you want to talk on a specific top group. It's almost like its own chat group. You can go into your radio, select that specific top group, and talk to that top group on that frequency. Let's say you're done talking to that top group and you want to talk to somebody else, go into your radio, select that new contact, and enter in to a whole new chat room to talk to that top group on DMR. Now, real quickly, I want to show you what this looks like in practice. So if we go down here to our menu and go to settings in the channel, under frequency, we will see that we are transmitting on 446.5. Now, we're also receiving on that exact same frequency, as you can see there. Now, if I want to talk to somebody, let's say a friend of mine, I can go in here and list, and I can give David Eatonholler or uh, Levi. Each one of these people has their own ID, and I can call them and use that same frequency to communicate with all of these different people without having to change frequencies. Now, there are time slots, as we mentioned, and when I programmed this radio, I assigned them to the appropriate time slot. The difference here with Hytera products is that you can actually go in and select whichever frequency you want to be a part of pseudo-trunking. If it's pseudo-trunking, it can automatically select which time slot is appropriate. Uh, I'm sorry, time slot is appropriate, whereas on non-Hytera products, since we don't have that pseudo-trunking option, we have to actually select that in the actual programming of the radio. So this is a visual example of what it looks like on my BTEC 6x2 Pro, which I've carried every day for years and am extremely familiar with. I want to shift our brain into, let's say, a hospital. A hospital has a lot of different things going on with it. They've got security that they need to run. They've got maintenance for the elevators and uh, potentially broken coffee machines. 
And then they've got the actual ER room or the infirmary or wherever. You have all of these different subsystems inside of a hospital. Well, instead of us having multiple different repeaters for multiple different people that we need to talk to, we could just have one standard frequency and the radio operator could select which talk group they need to talk to. Perhaps the ER surgeon needs to talk to somebody in security because something crazy is going on. He can go onto that radio, select the security talk group. In many cases, this can be programmed to a simple hotkey and key up security and let them know, hey, I've got a crazy situation going on in the infirmary. Maybe that gives you a better understanding of why this kind of stuff is valuable. It's fun to talk about the community aspect of radio and all the fun stuff that we can do on there, but I personally don't really look at this as a hobby. To me, this is a tool. This is a tool to be used to amplify my productivity in a given task. And ultimately, the amount of time on task that I have to spend switching over to different radio frequencies and programming them correctly, it's just inherently going to integrate different potential failures in my main task that I need to be performing. So this DMR, this talk groups, all this kind of stuff that we're talking about, it's really meant so that you can forget about the radio and focus about the task at hand and then let the radio do its most efficient job, which is communicating to the desired person or the desired talk group that you're trying to get a hold of. Let's focus back on pseudo-trunking. During the programming of your radio, which by the way, the programming of these radios is not complex, but it can be time-consuming, and maybe you don't have a computer that's capable of, uh, I don't know, having Windows 10 or 11 to download the software you need to program the radios, you can go to Rangeland Communications. Rangeland Communications is who provided us with all of this gear to be able to do all the testing evaluation. So we've been doing testing and evaluation on this for like four or five months at this point. They've been super gracious to loan this equipment out for us so that we could test and evaluate to bring you a really good comprehensive analysis of what exactly all this stuff does and how it functions out in the field. We did program these radios ourselves, but we had uh, Rangeland Communications send us one already programmed just to see what that experience was like. Rangeland Communications not only offers you all the equipment and much more that you see here in front of me, I think the most value that they offer, though, is in their customer support and in their ability to program stuff for you. Maybe there's a team that you want to integrate with that already has their own programming set up. Rangeland Communications can help you integrate with that. Or perhaps you're starting from scratch and you want to build up your own network yourself. Rangeland can also help you with that. So please go and visit Rangeland Communications. I'll link them down below, but let's get back to the video. Now, when you're programming these radios, you can assign the different talk groups to have the pseudo trunking function. As I mentioned before, you could have three different talk groups in time slot one, and then three other talk groups in time slot two. If you select all of them and give them pseudo trunking capabilities, it allows you to easily transition between all of those different talk groups at one time while still maintaining the efficiency of time division multiple access or TDMA. So where would you utilize equipment like the Hightera HR652? I can think of a few places. If you were in a bunker underground, maybe you would put it at the opening of the bunker so that your communications could make it from the underground out to the ground level. Uh, but today I'm at a park. Parks are often utilized as sort of command centers for communities who need relief efforts. They're a great place for people to gather for search and rescue or for other people to come and drop off supplies. And they're usually big enough to accommodate large groups of people. So come with me over to the bench as I set up this HR-652 and show you what it takes to get communications up and running in a disaster or an emergency. So there's not a whole lot to physically setting up the HR-652, but real quickly, I wanted to show you that is the power input. So if you wanted to uh, supply power directly to it, you would do it through that port there. We briefly mentioned the IP linking uh, that's where your Ethernet drop goes there uh, for connecting this to other HR652s. Now, I'm just going to connect this antenna directly to the HR652. But as I mentioned, if you have it inside of a building, um, obviously you need to get that antenna out of the building. So you may use a different style of antenna. Or maybe you're out at a park like this and you just want to get the antenna higher up in the air without having to physically move the radio. Um, you could use something like an inflatable antenna mast or a flagpole to attach your antenna potentially 25 or 50 feet higher than ground level, which if you've watched the video this far, you know would increase your line of sight and give you better range capabilities. Um, like I mentioned, this really isn't rocket science to set this up. You know, put the antenna on, drop your battery in, and away you go. Now here is where you would change the channels. As we mentioned, you know, maybe you have an analog channel or an encrypted channel or an unencrypted DMR channel. You could cycle through all of those here. 
uh, to meet the demands of your team and get the radio communications capabilities that you need for that specific endeavor. So again, all of that is set up in the programming, which is offered by Range Net Communications if you don't want to do it yourself. Thank you folks so much for watching. I hope you learned more about the HR 652 and DMR in general. I'm Jake with GridBase. We'll see you on the next one.